It's easy to forget just how supremely talented Fernando Torres was. Those with a short memory only seem to recall the struggles. Not the fearless teenager with the frosted tips who dragged his hometown club back from the brink, restoring the Colchoneros' pride one goal at a time. Nor do they willingly record his explosive debut season in the Premier League, where he delivered 24 goals to the Anfield faithful as the club's record signing. It was the first time the red side of Mersey had seen a number 9 score over 20 league goals since 1996. He was far from a flash in the pan either, making it to half a century of Premier League goals quicker than Sergio Aguero, Carlos Tevez and Thierry Henry. In fact, there wasn't a single stage that Fernando didn't make his own. He claimed three major honours for his country, scoring in two finals and walking away with man of the match in one of them. For a brief period of time, he was the Golden Generation's clutch player. In fact, in 2008, only Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo stood in the way of him being crowned FIFA World Player of the Year. Yet, a little over a decade later, he retired to minimal fanfare, respected by his peers, but often defined by his injuries or failures amongst fans. It's time that we put that right. Well, that was dramatic, wasn't it? Hello you dirty dogs and welcome back to One on One, the most in-depth football show on YouTube. Today, at your behest, we are reassessing the legacy of Fernando Torres, a career of dizzying highs and gut-wrenching lows, but ultimately one that deserves a little more respect. And to make the experience all the more authentic, we've teamed up with Classic Football Shirts to bring you some of El Nino's most memorable kits. There will be a link in the description below if you want to cop one of these bad boys for yourself. I've even sorted you a bloody discount code. And if that wasn't enough, I'll also be answering some of your comments from the previous episode at the end of the show. Let's go. Chapter 1. A Decade of Excellence Fernando José Torres Sanz was born in Fuenlabrada, a municipality of roughly 200,000 people located on the outskirts of Madrid. El Nino is the area's most famous son, and in 2011, CF Buena Labrada renamed their stadium after him. However, the team that set Fernando Torres on his way was Parque 84. He was only five years old when he joined, and he was desperate to emulate his hero, Captain Tsuba, a Japanese football cartoon. Originally, a young Fernando wanted to follow in the footsteps of his older brother, Israel, and become a goalkeeper. Fortunately, his coaches soon convinced him that a move to striker might be more beneficial. After scoring 55 goals in a single season for his next club, Rayo 13, the boy with the shock of blonde hair quickly appeared on Atleti's radar. Five years later, he'd signed for them professionally. What's important to remember is back then, Atleti weren't the same beacon of consistency that they are today. After winning La Liga in the 95-96 campaign, they were relegated just four seasons later, for the first time in 65 years. Owner Jesus Gil was arrested and suspended over tax evasion and misuse of club funds, while manager Claudio Ranieri resigned after the club entered administration. Torres' rise to prominence coincided with this tumultuous period. In 1998, he led Atleti's under-15s to victory in the highly respected Knight Cup, where he was voted best player in his age category. Less than two years later, he was making his debut in the first team, age 17. It took Torres just a week to get off the mark, but he was rarely selected thereafter. The following summer, he announced himself to every scout on the continent by leading Spain's under-16s to the European Championship, scoring the only goal in the final, something he'd develop a knack for. He also finished as the tournament's leading goalscorer and was voted MVP once again. Put simply, at youth level, the kid could not be contained. The tournament also roughly aligned with the return of club legend Luis Aragonés, taking charge of Atleti for the seventh time. As the club's all-time top goalscorer, Aragonés knew a good striker when he saw one, and his stewardship would prove vital when it came to progressing Torres from child prodigy to first-team star. So much so that Torres refers to Aragonés as his father in football. His first season under the wily old manager was tough, not just mentally, but physically punishing too. At just 17, Fernando played over 2,300 minutes in the Segunda Division, scoring six and assisting four in that time. Just to give you some form of comparison there, Cristiano Ronaldo didn't put up 2,000 league minutes until he was 19. Lionel Messi, even later, at 21. Torres wasn't exactly eased into the side. They needed him from such a young age. That summer, Torres shone again on the international front, this time at the Under-19 European Championship. It was to be a repeat performance of his Under-16 exploits. He claimed top goal scorer, best player, and scored the only goal in the final once more. At this point, there was just no stopping him. 
While Torres may not have been central to the club's promotion in 2001-2, he was pivotal when it came to their top flight rehabilitation. In 2002-3, before his season was curtailed with a small injury, he was scoring or assisting every other game. And just so we're clear on his importance to the side at this early juncture in his career, the next highest goal scorer at Atletico that season was midfielder Luis Garcia on seven. In fact, when the club were promoted, it took him just two weeks to open his account. He later wrote, In four matches, I went from a virtual unknown to a player people were talking about. Following a particularly eye-catching performance against Barcelona, Spanish paper El Pace hailed Torres as the most exciting newcomer since Raul. The REOAS compared him to Marco van Basten. It was actually at this point that Chelsea's infatuation with Fernando Torres began. That summer, new owner Roman Abramovich apparently lodged a huge £28 million bid. Had it been accepted, it would have dwarfed the Premier League's biggest deal that summer, which just so happened to be Cristiano Ronaldo from Sporting to Manchester United for €19 million. Euros. However, Atletico fended off everyone's advances, and that included Barcelona, AC Milan and Juventus. After placing 12th, just four points above Espanyol in 17th, the powers that be knew the team would be relegation fodder without their star striker. A further 19 league strikes followed in 2003-04, 13 more than anyone else in the side. At this point, his importance to the club was only becoming more profound. In response, Atletico made him their youngest ever captain aged just 19. Deals with Pepsi, Sony, Australia and Nike followed as he became the club's most valuable asset both on and off the pitch. Now, his captaincy is a big part of his legacy, isn't it? So it's been interesting to observe his comments on it since. In typically humble fashion, Torres has gone on the record to say that despite wearing the armband, he still looked to the likes of Demetrio Albertini and Sergi Bajuan to lead the side. The pair were in their early 30s and had Champions League and La Liga titles to their name. However, he's probably doing himself a bit of a disservice. Despite not being the most vocal and a slightly introspective character, he still led by example on the pitch, playing 110 of Atleti's next 114 league games. By the end of the 2006-07 season, aged just 22, Torres had contributed to 92 of Atletico's 228 goals since they'd returned to the top flight. Unsurprisingly, bids flooded in once more. One thing was for sure, he wasn't going to arch-rivals Real Madrid, who'd repeatedly chased his signature. Torres told friends at the time that a move to his cross-city rivals would be immoral. Chelsea remained keen, but it was Rafa Benitez's Liverpool that secured his signature in 2007, shedding out a club record £20 million. Torres used to scribe, you'll never walk alone on the inside of his captain's armband while at Atleti. Admittedly, not because he was a Liverpool fan, but just because he and his friends loved the sentiment. Still, it added to the sense that he and the Reds were meant to be. Close friend Antonio Sanz has since said that, contrary to popular belief, Torres wasn't exactly set on leaving Atleti. Eventually, what persuaded him to depart was the fact that the club needed the money from his sale to rebuild after years of financial mismanagement. After all, Liverpool were aside in transition too, having just finished below Cross City rivals Everton in the Premier League. By the end of the season, the disdain of the Anfield faithful was almost palpable, not helped by a string of high-profile flops. They needed someone to come in and lift the club. El Nino was an instant hit, becoming the first Liverpool striker since Robbie Fowler to score over 20 league goals. Ironically, he'd score against longtime admirers Chelsea just 15 minutes into his debut. A blur of speed, energy and power. That season, he'd scored 12 times in eight successive home games, including two back-to-back hat-tricks as well as the winner in a Merseyside derby. He was fast becoming the Premier League's golden boy finishing second to Cristiano Ronaldo in the Football Writers Player of the Year. He followed up his stellar debut in England with international honours, scoring two goals at Euro 2008. Crucially, one of them arrived in the final, a game where he was awarded Man of the Match. Despite recurrent hamstring injuries in 2008-9, he still scored 17 goals in 38 appearances and was named in FIFA Pro's World XI for the second year running. The hamstring injuries were particularly worrying though, as he'd only suffered one muscle injury in six years while at Atleti. The frequency with which the injuries started to present themselves was clearly weighing on Torres' mind. He would later refer to his hamstring as the muscle I lived by, as that's where he derived his trademark speed and acceleration. A double surgery in 09-10 beckoned following persistent knee and groin problems. 
although he still finished as the club's top goal scorer with 22 goals in 32 appearances. However, that summer, Torres would make a career-altering decision, one that would take his body to the point of no return. Despite originally undergoing surgery in January for his problematic right knee, Torres had featured heavily in the second half of the season, playing through a great deal of discomfort. Ultimately, he'd need surgery again in April, leaving him with a two-week window post-recovery to make Spain's World Cup squad. Ramon Kugat, his surgeon, said he will need to be very careful when he returns, as the knee must be strong enough to play on. It could be argued that Fernando did the opposite, rushing himself back in order to be selected. Upon making the squad, it was even agreed that he wouldn't feature until the round of 16, giving him further time to recuperate. That plan was scuppered when Spain lost their opening fixture to Switzerland. The tournament favourites were in disarray and called upon their number nine. Fernando had a decision to make and ultimately put his body on his line for his country. He failed to score in seven games, although his attempted through ball to Iniesta fell at the feet of Cesc Fabregas, who would then set the midfielder up to score the winner. However, moments later, he was writhing around in agony on the turf, having damaged his groin again. He was stretched off in tears while the rest of his teammates were celebrating their world champion status on the pitch. Reflecting on the tournament, Torres said, It felt like the sky was the limit until then. Looking back with perspective, it might not have been a smart decision to play. More heartbreak would follow. After three and a half successful years, his relationship with senior management at Liverpool quickly began to deteriorate. By the time that Roy Hodgson was installed at the helm, Xabi Alonso and Javier Mascherano were long gone, and Torres was of the opinion that the club was as far away from silverware as they'd ever been. That summer, Liverpool's most expensive recruit was Raul Morales from Porto. For posterity, I've also dug out the last 11 that Torres was involved in. You can decide for yourself whether you think his argument has any substance. After voicing his concerns to the club's director of football strategy, Damian Kamali, Torres felt like the Liverpool hierarchy were indifferent whether he stayed or went. In full knowledge, they'd get a big transfer fee for him. When consulting Steven Gerrard about a potential exit, the Liverpool skipper said one thing to him. You need to do what's best for you. In January 2011, the Spaniard handed in the transfer request. Speaking about his exit on his documentary, Torres said, I wish I had tried harder to keep the team together and insisted they sign new players. They never came through with the promises they made when I signed, and the club was a mess. Chelsea's bid of £40 million had been knocked back, but they landed their man for a British transfer record £50 million. This made him the fourth most expensive player of all time. The Liverpool fans were hurting, even more so after his first interview for Chelsea. I never kissed the Liverpool badge, never, no. I see some players doing that one week after joining a club, but the romanticism in football has gone. It's different now, people are coming and leaving. The shirt is a uniform, not a skin. Well, he definitely need thick skin to get through the next four years of his career. Chapter 2. The Football Abyss as luck would have it, his debut as Chelsea's most expensive player of all time would come against Liverpool, and the reunion didn't exactly go according to plan. The Spaniard was repeatedly snuffed out by Carragher and Agar, and was substituted shortly before Raul Morales scored the only goal of the game for the visitors. His performance was an ominous sign of things to come. Saying that, his lack of decisiveness in this game wouldn't have come as a great surprise to Liverpool's more observant fans, who'd watched their formerly imperious number nine struggle to replicate that 0-9-10 form during the first half of the season. As Jamie Carragher would later tell Sky, I was shocked by the money they paid. He hadn't had a great 18 months. His one good game that season was against Chelsea at Anfield when we beat them 2-0 and he scored both. Despite taking a career-high number of shots at the start of 10-11, they were getting increasingly desperate, with 1.2 of them arriving from outside the box, roughly 50% higher than the season before. In little over six months, his goals per 90 had halved, from an elite 0.95 per 90 to a middling 0.43. His level would then bottom out completely in his first six months at Chelsea. One goal in 14 appearances left him with a strike rate of 0.12 per 90 inferior to that of right-back Branislav Ivanovic. It wasn't the sort of form that was going to displace regulars Nicolas Anelka and Didier Drogba. He began to feature heavily as a substitute. The struggle continued next season, and he only netted six times in 32 Premier League games, 12 of them coming off the bench. Even when Torres got his hands on those domestic trophies that he so desperately craved during his time at Liverpool, he was only a bit part player. Bright spots included the golden boot at Euro 2012 and that goal against Barcelona. 
after which many fans and pundits exalted him of his hefty transfer fee. He also won the corner that Drogba converted in the Champions League final, securing the club their first European honours. He would fare much better under Rafa Benitez in the 2012-13 season, with 22 goals in all competitions, including one against Benfica in the Europa League final. In fact, no Chelsea striker has topped his 22 goals in all competitions since. However, this renaissance was short-lived. As an individual, he was no longer good enough leading the line to deliver Chelsea the Premier League. His efforts as a teammate during this period, however, have probably gone somewhat underrated. If you take away that dreadful first half season in 10-11, then his record of 34 goal involvements from 64 Premier League starts tells a slightly different story. After losing both mobility and confidence, he clearly tried to pivot his game and become a better creator for those around him. In his last two seasons at Chelsea, he placed second and third respectively for assists. A disappointment? Sure. A complete flop? Hardly. Torres has since compared his time at Chelsea to swimming in wet clothes, but he didn't let it sink his career. He rallied against his knee injury and father time to deliver one last swan song. Chapter 3. An Underrated Return after a low-key loan spell at AC Milan, Atletico engineered a homecoming for their faltering legend in January 2015. He marked his return to the capital in style, scoring against both Barcelona and Real Madrid in the ensuing weeks. Simeone rotated him pretty heavily in and out of the side, appearing to prefer a front two of Griezmann and Mario Mandzukic. However, the big Croat left for Juventus that summer, meaning there'd be more game time for Torres to prove himself. Despite starting the season on the bench, El Nino rolled back the years during the run-in. He scored six goals in his last nine appearances, reaching double figures in the league for the first time in five seasons. In total, he would score 11 and assist four in just under 1,700 minutes, contributing to a goal or assist every 112 minutes. Ultimately, this meant he finished the season as the club's second highest scorer and third best creator. Despite his individual renaissance, it would be a season of if buts and maybes for Atletico as a whole. They lost the league by four points and were defeated by arch-rivals Real Madrid in the Champions League final on penalties. On a more positive note, Torres' unlikely turnaround earned him more time at the club, having originally arrived just on loan. During the next two years, his relationship with Simeone would call and he'd be reduced to the role of impact substitute. He did finally fulfill a childhood dream in his last season, however. In 2018, Atleti beat Marseille 3-0 in the Europa League final, the first time he'd win major silverware with his hometown club. He may not have played a starring role, but the win gave him the closure he'd deserved on his journey with Atletico. Torres called it his most important trophy. He would depart for Japan as Atleti's sixth highest goalscorer of all time. 43 behind his old mentor, Luis Aragonés, a record he surely would have smashed if they hadn't needed to sell him all those years ago. Conclusion The second half of Fernando Torres' career is often derided as a complete failure. A period in which he won domestic and European silverware, became the first player to score in two European Championship finals, surpassed 100 league goals for Atleti and a centenary of caps for his country. For other players, any one of these may have been their zenith. But as we watched Fernando fall from a great height, what he lost became more pronounced than what he added to his trophy cabinet. Post-2010, he was no longer a special player, but he still enjoyed special moments. However, even these were unfairly diluted, largely because of a price tag that he had no control over. Yes, he wasn't able to shine following his record move to Chelsea, but at that point, he'd already transformed the fortunes of two clubs. He helped restore Atleti at their lowest ebb, maintaining their La Liga status in the face of intense pressure. He turned Liverpool into genuine title contenders at the first time of asking, after a six-year absence from the Premier League's top two. And it was his goal that ended Spain's 44-year wait for an international trophy. When times were tough, Fernando delivered, and he put his body on the line to do so. That should be his legacy. Fernando Torres truly was an idol for tough times. That's a wrap on this episode of One on One. Thanks for sticking out to the bitter end, guys. What do you want to see me do next? Let me know in the comments below or on Instagram or on Twitter. And don't forget, if you want to cop one of those shirts, there is a link to them in the description below. And as a Football Daily subscriber, we've sorted you out a discount code. Make sure you take full advantage of that. Right, back to your comments from last week. Let's do a couple of them 
before we call time on this shindig. Michael Daigler said, big up Chris for these series. Love the in-depth takes, man. Big up yourself, Michael. Great smile, great teeth, good picture. Look like a pure, honest guy. Having a think about ways we can tinker with the format, which episodes or parts of episodes have you liked? Uh, let me know in the comments below because it's been quite experimental so far and want to kind of bring it together, consolidate it a little bit more, be a bit more efficient. Noob King has said, arrogance always leads to downfall. It's a very Yoda-like statement from you. Are you a small green Jedi, Noob King? Let me know on Twitter. Uh, I could use a man with your skill set. Bill Fantozzi. I would pay an unbelievable amount of money to watch a new one of these every single day. Getting them out bi-weekly has been hard enough because obviously juggling it with Winners and losers, Sunday vibes, some more administrative stuff that you guys maybe don't see. Um, but Bill, if you want to just make me your like personal little monkey uh, and just throw money at me to, to kind of turn these around like in your cellar and then present them to you at the end of the day, I'm totally fine with that. Show me those Benjamins. Jordan Renson. Love this episode, Chris. Thank you very much, Jordan. Big up yourself. Would love an athletic Bill Bow episode. Now, quite a lot of people have been asking for a bit more insight on the whole Basque-only policy and how things are run from the inside club because they're quite insular. How things are run from inside the club because they're quite insular. Um, so that might be a really interesting one. Might get a LinkedIn. See if I can, you know, worm my way in somehow through the, like, media assistant. Brady Morris. It's been a while since I've been called a dirty dog by Chris. Brady... If you made it to the end of this video, if you're hearing this, you are a dirty dog of the highest order. Thank you very much for your support. Goes out to everyone. Uh, the story behind that is that my old man used to call people dirty dogs when they'd done him dirty. Um, so I just kind of picked it up, flipped its meaning, I guess, and now I use it as a term of endearment. So, yeah, that's that's that. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to level with you guys. I'm absolutely knackered. I'm going to wrap this up right now. And uh, I will see you on Football Daily in the week. Bye.